Welcome to this podcast series about coffee science. It is for the patient listener who wants the full story of Coffee Mind's approach to a science-based education, which is developed during our involvement with research at the University of Copenhagen and our work with SCAE's education and research activities, as well as teaching thousands of students at London School of Coffee and Coffee Mind Academy in Copenhagen, and also consulting coffeepreneurs worldwide since 2007. This podcast series might be a bit long and with a lot of details, but I've decided to hold nothing back, which means that a patient listener will get rewarded with a deep understanding of how we in Coffee Mind work with science-based theories for education and consultancy purposes. Something you might find interesting if you work with education, either under some of the established organizations such as SCA, CQI and other coffee education systems, or if you work internally with education in a company, or even if you have coffee as a hobby and settle for no less than the full story. If you find this podcast too long and detailed, it's not because I'm boring. It's because you fall outside the intended audience. Our podcast called Coffee Science for Coffeepreneurs is for the coffee professional who already has experience and knows the fundamental concepts of coffee roasting and sensory methodology. If you don't and still want to learn, you can of course still listen to this podcast and learn, but you might have to plan to pause a few times and browse the internet, books, and ask a coffee professional or two in the process to clarify concepts and ideas. Coffee Mind's mission is to bring scientific method to the coffee community, to help provide clarity for coffeepreneurs, to support them getting on the quickest, cheapest, and least risky road to the success they dream about. This podcast hopes to clean up the mess when it comes to some of the most fundamental concepts used in the coffee business, but also to start a conversation about it so that we can get to the next level on these subjects together. Firstly, I have to admit that all of this comes out of a purely personal frustration Ida and I experience in the very first hours of most of our sensory and roasting classes. As trained scientists, we have to spend a lot of time dismantling a lot of misleading ideas and concepts that have been gathered in the specialty coffee community over the last 20-30 years. It is quite a waste of time and a lot of repetition, which by the years is becoming more and more frustrating. Outside our classes, we often talk about something we know to be true from a scientific point of view, only to be met with an attitude of, well, that's just your opinion. What we say is not just our opinion, but our best efforts to be aligned with the scientific methods as we see it, which we don't mind to discuss. But for this to happen, we need to go a bit deeper. It seems that the global coffee community itself has not really started this deeper conversation about scientific principle, which is needed if we as a community want to be better at distinguishing between opinion and qualified knowledge. Often this kind of qualified knowledge would be called evidence-based knowledge, but I've avoided this word as that might imply that only knowledge published in a scientific paper would be good enough and that is not our opinion. As long as the fundamental scientific principles are correctly applied and aligned with established theory of science and research design, it is qualified knowledge, even if it's not published scientifically. Most experience-based opinions are not bad at all, as they could be a good point of departure for a hypothesis to be tested, but before it is tested, it is just a qualified opinion and not true knowledge. I feel there is a specific need for the content in this podcast series because much of the new research projects coming out from universities 
in universities these days seems more focused on ge- generating new knowledge than dismantling the misleading concepts that has flooded the specialty coffee community globally for many years and causes a lot of daily confusion in product development and quality control processes. It is great with new research, but we also need to address the misunderstandings of fundamental concepts and methods used daily in the global community. This podcast series is not only addressing the vague general concepts used in the community and education systems, but also the direct misuse of scientific concepts, methods, and scientific conclusions used daily by coffeepreneurs in their businesses. The purpose of this podcast is not just to tear down theories, but to build up by clarifying scientific methodology with the purpose of bringing a new foundation for the community on which we can build precise theories that does not waste anybody's time and are precise and specific enough for the community to be result-oriented when developing products and controlling quality across relevant process parameters. Particularly, our focus is to provide a specific and clear foundation for the education systems that seems to be burdened by decades of opinion-driven models and claims that just don't keep up with scientific principles. We do not rule out handcraft and intuition as important factors as a coffee professional, but using scientific theories and concepts wrong is not leaving more space for intuition and handcraft. It only creates confusion. And a confused mind is not more intuitive nor better at carrying out their handcraft. My coffee friend Stephen Lee says this beautiful uh, in an interview, and there's a link in the show notes, where he uses his experience as a musician to provide a great model of the role of the scientific slash technical aspect of art It goes like this in my interpretation of it. You need to be so skilled in the technical aspect of what you are doing that you, at some point, forget about the technicalities because your technical skills has now turned into habit and only at this level you can focus on the art itself. We need clarity on the scientific and technical level before we can elevate ourselves to artists. And as long as we're confused about the technical aspect, we struggle. The art is the master and the technicalities and science is the slave. That is our goal. But as long as we don't master the science, we are slaves of our bad and imprecise use of what we think is good science. After almost two decades working with coffee education from a scientific perspective, it appears to me that only two fundamental misleading approaches to education are responsible for an impressive amount of confusion in our community. So I'll just talk about these two specific um, uh, misleading concepts or approaches. The first is the failure by, uh, by mixing technicalities with preferences. And that shows up as hunting for a sweet spot or some kind of universal superior quality that is the true quality uh, or very specific technical recommendations as if there's only one obvious or true optimal flavor of coffee that we are all hunting for. Technicalities should be about control and how to navigate the general terrain And once you master this, you can go hunting for uh, different flavors. And once you master the technicalities, you can create different flavors to be able to strategically create different products to different customer segments. First, you learn how to drive, and then later, you can go to different given places on a map by having a destination and a place to go uh, on this map. In education, we should focus on how to control flavor diversity and how to map this to different customer segments. Companies can choose broad or narrow product ranges and a broad or narrow customer segment um, uh, model, depending on the business vision. But education has to be broad and inclusive when teaching technicalities and not paying students into a preference corner as part of the education. Once you master the technicalities, you can go narrow but education has to keep the big picture in mind. And then 
the other uh, misleading approach is obsession with small details of process parameters. Small differences are only relevant for people who have worked so much with coffee that only them and a few other people in the world would be able to pick up the nuances. Okay, fair enough. There's nothing wrong with that in itself, but the problem is that these detailed obsessive theories often set out the whole global coffee community chasing unicorns because in reality, many of these alleged small differences are just good theories and actually doesn't really exist objectively. If you describe a theory that predicts an extremely small difference but is vaguely defined, nobody could really catch the theory of being wrong. Therefore, it survives as a convincing narrative, even though nobody has ever really gained from it because it did not make a difference in the first place. I know that the above sounds obvious and that you perhaps don't expect that this criticism will be relevant for most of the practices we have in the specialty uh, coffee business worldwide. But the patient listener who are willing to go through the whole podcast series will be surprised how mu uh, much of the theories in roasting and sensory in education worldwide are based on these fundamental errors. It is a bit ironic that everybody wants science on their side, and I really think that some people are quite unscrupulous, claiming to have built their knowledge and education concept on scientific principles, when somebody want a, a, with a scientific background quickly can see through this in seconds. And the loser in this game is the hard-working coffeepreneur who are undertaking a huge risk in an uncertain adventure with error and time wasters, where error and time wasters are a big problem. Just because you know how to jot down some numbers, use a calculator, set up a simple calculation and can name drop some few molecules does not make your methods or concepts scientific. My purpose of this podcast is not to scare everybody without a scientific degree from using scientific methods. It's actually quite the contrary. I'm trying to create a situation where we should only uh, I'm not trying to uh, create a situation where we should only trust statements from people with a minimum of a bachelor of science. In fact, Often because scientists are educated as specialists in the field, they often make makes mistakes at the level of scientific theory when trying to understand and collaborate with other scientists. Or even worse, if they don't understand the other field of science, they have a tendency to look down on us uh, or underestimate the rigorousness and complexity of other sciences such as we often see when chemists are either collaborating or making assumptions about sensory properties of coffee just by knowing the chemistry, which is often we have demonstrated not to be possible. There's not a trivial link between chemistry and sensory properties. You need to taste the coffees to say anything about how it tastes, so you can't skip the sensory test just because you know the chemical aspects of the coffees, and some chemists are a bit reluctant to get this point. So this podcast might be as useful for scientists to get a better grip of the foundation for all sciences so that they can uh, better collaborate with other scientists. And it's interesting because scientists often go straight to the core material of the science that they study and also uh, later investigate. And theory of science and research design as such is often not dealt with uh, other than on really small classes during their education. Uh, and that might, is often classes they never really find interesting because it's not about the core of what they, uh, the science. It's a, it seems it is considered some a bit more fluffy and uh, opinion um, uh, driven uh, to talk about the theory of science. So my hope with this podcast is the opposite of trying to scare non-scientists into using science. I'm trying to make the scientific methodology simple and specific enough for everybody to start it, uh, using it correctly, regardless of degree or not. I've done more than 30 research projects and which nine are published uh, in scientific papers and uh, there will be two more in the first quarter of, uh, uh, of this year. So my point is that I don't have a PhD, which is the standard acad uh, academic education to become a publishing researcher, but that uh, did not stop me from uh, doing research in the first place. 
So normally a PhD project ends up with three to four articles, and I've got nine and counting. So I'm an example of the fact that you don't need to have a science degree uh, or a formal training to do it. So everybody, if they just use scientific principles correctly and are thorough in what they do, can actually do it. Uh, and it is indeed my hope that the community as such will contribute to science even though you haven't gone back to, uh, to school and ta taken all the formal things that is the normal uh, procedure to get it done. So my opinion is that the scientific principles are useful for everybody and when looking at them they are more like a series of common sense principles when it comes to the effort of making an experiment and making sure that what you do is correct, which is necessary to trust the conclusion in the project. My opinion is that these principles can be understood and applied regardless of educational background and therefore it is my hope that they can be spread wide and far in the global, global coffee community regardless of educational background. I've done research both with Tim Venelbo and Rob Hoos, who are not scientists, and I don't recall that we had a single contro uh, controversy about methodology dur during any of those projects, and I really felt that we were perfectly aligned when it came to what to do, how to do it, uh, and also a, correct, a correct distinction between something that is just a hypothesis and what is actually facts. If you are honest about what you know and what you don't know, and also are careful to set up everything uh, so that you are not making any conceptual mis uh, uh, mistakes along the way, the rest is actually just common sense. It is really my hope with this podcast to make fertile ground for future discussions, not to be about if I'm right or if another uh, person is uh, right or wrong, but simply uh, a d discussion about if I'm using the right concepts the right ways and the right methods the right ways to build the theories and the conclusions that I'm drawing. I'm just so tired of being uh, in discussion where people think that I'm going personally after somebody else just because I'm criticizing a theory. It is my opinion that the global coffee community does not have time for this type of ego bumping amongst educators and consultants. The question is not who is right or wrong, but is rather which principles and theories are best at helping the global community um, to maximize its purpose, which I think is to create amazing social aesthetic experiences for as many uh, people as possible through good coffee experiences. Anything that supports this mission is right and anything hindering this is wrong. And the question of who is right or wrong is hindering dialogue and clarity. I'm stressing this now because what you will hear later is very harsh criticism of some of the most established concepts used in the field we are working in, namely in coffee roasting and sensory methodology. And we don't have time for imprecise or di directly wrong concepts. We are here to support the community and time wasting is the worst time of waste. So whatever we can do, we will do to avoid this. I've compiled a long list of references for this podcast series that you can access in the podcast notes for everybody to pursue the concepts on their own and take me out of the equation. Of course, I've made mistakes and wrong conclusions in this podcast series, but by providing a comprehensive reference list, I hope that we can start talking about right or wrong concepts and not about who is right or who is wrong when feedback starts coming our way uh, after this podcast. I have really tried to uh, take myself out of the equation and just play the role of the messenger for classical theory of science and established research design methodology. But of course, I... Um, really try to expand all this into all corners of what we're doing in ed education, consultancy and research. So I look forward to getting feedback on where I've crossed lines and made wrong conclusions. But please keep your feedback aligned with the fundamental scientific concepts you find here or other places in, in the literature of theory of science and research design. Let's try to develop the concepts we are working with and not waste time on ego bombing. The fundamental concepts you operate by are important because the wrong concepts could lead you to waste a lot of time 
focusing on aspects and activities that do not lead to useful results. Because you would have to look and make an effort com and, uh, uh, elsewhere to get useful result at all. It is my experience that thousands of people are wasting time looking in the wrong place for a result, and I feel that we are amongst the few uh, people telling um, uh, them that they are looking in the wrong direction, because the fundamental concepts that they are using are giving them a wrong focus. Sometimes we feel like the policeman in the classical streetlight effect story, where a policeman sees a person crawling under a street lamp because he has lost his keys, and even though he's been looking for a very long time, they just seem to be lost. After looking for a while, the policeman asks the person to specify where he lost them. And to the policeman's surprise, uh, the man points on a dark path leading to the street light and not an area under the street light. And then the policeman says, but why are we looking here then if you lost them over there? And the man says, because the light is better here. My point is that it is important where you focus and, um, and who is guiding your focus. If you're not careful about the method used by the guide, you might up wasting a lot of time in areas that are completely fruitless for you. And given the risk and resource scarcity for coffeepreneurs, this is not a small problem. It seems like the policeman could provide a better, met better method. His torch could light up the dark path where you lost your keys, uh, where I think you will get a better result than looking where you didn't lose them, but where you have better light. So that's the power of focus. As mentioned before, science is not just a few calculations and molecules taken out of context. Science is the continuously refined method behind the historical scientific breakthroughs. To those of you who don't know, it might be useful to mention that often theory of science and research design is done by people with very different professions are, and are therefore two different subjects. Theory of science is generated by philosophers and research design comes from the mathematical tradition supporting uh, the natural sciences. Many philosophers have a bit of a skeptical approach to science, claiming that science is not u a unified method anyway, as different sciences use different methods and don't agree with uh, which method is the correct one, and history always proves that surprises are lurking around any corner for any theory. Um, so it will become clear through this podcast series that I'm really excited about the natural sciences with research design and statistical methods as foundation, but I also strongly believe that there is a limit to what can be explained by the natural sciences when it comes to social dynamics, aesthetics, the nature of consciousness, and other experience originating from the inner dimensions of the human domain. But I think the purpose, for the purpose of clarity, the scientific method and how it is best used and not used by the specialty coffee community worldwide, um, it is really useful and it is also really useful to navigate the best practices in production and education. It, it, is ma makes sense, it, it does make sense to assume that for the natural sciences, there is a well-established body of fundamental concepts and methods that we can use to handle the physical and chemical entities we pr pr process as coffeepreneurs. This is what I want to flesh out in this podcast series. And, and for this perspective, I'm without any hesitation excited, regardless of what a skeptical philosopher might say. I know that this introduction seems a bit arrogant, but my point is exactly that this is not about you, me, or anybody else's ego. The reason that Ida and I believe that we are often right and others are wrong in the aforementioned discussions is not because we want to be right based on the title we got from our education, but rather some really specific and historically founded principles on which science as such is based. The purpose of this podcast is to put these principles out there so that our personalities can be taken out of the equation and the principles can be discussed and applied beyond anybody's ego. 
And even though I want to take my uh, ego out of the equation, I still think that it is useful for the listener to get a bit of background of why I'm qualified to even talk about these principles at all. Therefore, I have made this quick intro to my background for understanding scientific methodology, which also explains why I'm so obsessed about using and defending scientific methodology against misuse. My father was a high school teacher in physics and mathematics and uh, taught me a lot about uh, the evolution of classical physics into quantum mechanics and relati relativity theory. And I did my high school uh, dissertation about quantum physics. Later at the university, I studied biology and I got a thorough introduction to a lot of really basic scientific disciplines all the way from physical chemistry and to organic chemistry and so and more and more advanced molecules up to biochemistry and then cellular structures that starts with bacteria and fungi and then uh, simple animals and uh, tissues in bigger animals and ecology and uh, we also had uh, quite an amount of uh, research design and statistics because you've got so many things to cover in biology you need to have a lot of different types of research designs to really explore uh, the living world. I really loved this and for the first time in my life I really went for it in school and got good grades. I never tried that before. After taking the basic ed education in biology I switched my major to philosophy where I got a general introduction to western philosophy but I specialized in comparative studies between western cognitive science and Tibetan Buddhism. <laughs> So I had to really go deep in the theory of science in order to make any sense of this in a, from a scientific perspective. And I used, used really, um, perhaps you think, weird uh, traditions such as Husserl's and Heidegger's phenomenology and hermeneutics, and uh, also really classical Western theory of science. And, uh, and specifically, I used Francisco Varela's neurophenomenology and Kellen Wilber's integral three, uh, theory to build the bridges between these very different cultural traditions. So if you want to uh, know more about this, you can uh, search for these uh, concepts and, uh, and uh, philosophers. And uh, for two years after studying biology and while studying philos philosophy, I had a student job teaching theory of science for biology students at the university. So that was two really uh, forming years in, in going to the uh, theory of science aspect of uh, bio biological uh, sciences. And uh, then later, uh, from 2007 to 2012, I was uh, also teaching um, medical research design and statistics to students uh, of medicines at the University of Copenhagen. So basically we had a pile of scientific articles to go through, uh, medical articles, where I was teaching them to understand the fundamental research design in each article and the statistical concepts and the results and the scope of the conclusions, what's set and what is not set with a specific article uh, at hand. There can be a lot of confusions where articles are used outside their scope and this is what I see all the time as well in coffee. Um, so I started my passionate pursuit of coffee science as early as in 2003 where I did a project at the university explaining the chemistry of espresso brewing uh, from theory I found in Ely's Science of Quality book. And in 2004, I made a theoretical model of cappuccino foam uh, together with dairy professor Richard Ibsen uh, uh, from the University of uh, Copenhagen. And I presented this model at Nordic Barista Cup in Iceland in 2004, which led to my first research, fun uh, research funding, again, which resulted in my first scientific publication in 2011 in International Dairy Journal. And um, I was running smaller project at the university to kickstart my career as self-taught scientist. It wasn't really the plan, it was just my interest, so I just went for it. And <laughs> uh, so it was, uh, uh, the self-taught scientist was more like a consequence of all this. But in 2014, this led to the SCAE funding a small part-time position at Food Science in Copenhagen. And here my job was to convince Danish bachelor and master's thesis students to work with coffee, which gave the students some really relevant projects. And uh, we, as a coffee community, got a lot of relevant and really cheap projects done, funded by the Danish government indirectly. 
This was running for four years and led to around 20 projects, of which six were scientifically published between 2014 and 19. Ida's industrial PhD in Coffee Mount about sensory learning is currently my most intense involvement in science. My role in this project is to be company supervisor, which involves a lot of project design, planning and execution in close collaboration with Ida, the university and our partners around the world running the sensory performance course associated with this research project. If you live in South Korea or Saudi Arabia, you will be able to participate in this course with X29 in South Korea and Arabian Coffee Institute in Saudi. And if you're not uh, shy of uh, traveling, you can go to these places uh, even if you are not, uh, don't live in these countries. So what does a good theory look like? If there are bad theories, there must be good theories and these good theories must be explained specifically what does it take to be a good theory? And I'll explain my approach to theory by addressing it at three different levels, from start, uh, uh, a really short, just a sentence, to a really long format where I explain why. And the first level is more like a short sentence, capturing the most important parts. The sentence might be more correct than elegant, and uh, hopefully somebody more fluent in the English language can help me uh, straighten it up, this up, but this is uh, the first version, at least. A good coffee theory is capturing the most self-critical and simple way of saying something specific about a relevant expected sensory difference, which is specific in both the way it was created, how it was evaluated, and also specific when it comes to the audience for which the expected difference is expected to be relevant. <laughs> Just reading this, uh, I think you agree that um, this sentence might need a little explanation. So this is the next level and it's a bit longer and explaining all the elements in this sentence. The list of eight specific features of a good theory that I, I've tried to make uh, into a short list that will be explained even deeper on level three. But level two goes like this. The first feature of a good theory is that it chooses simplicity over complexity whenever possible. And um, the second point is that a small cause typically has a small effect unless there is a really well-established theory that explains otherwise. So expect small outcome differences from small differences in, in input parameters or small differences between samples in a setup. The third point is form follows function. And design of a research purpose, uh, design of a research project follows purpose. So the type of method you choose for the specific research project needs to be to directly satisfy the purpose of doing the research projects in the first place, which is given and specified through the audience for whom the expected difference is both perceivable and relevant. Fourth point, the theory is extremely specific in the description of the circumstances and the setup of the experiment, which is also called the input parameters. Point five, the theory is extremely specific and narrow in the description of the expected outcome of the experiment, as explained by the basic scientific theory underlying the hypothesis of the research project. Point six, the everything else equal principle only change one input parameter at the time for the different samples in the research project and make sure these differences are the relevant differences to answer the given research questions that is related to the purpose of the research in the first place. Point number seven. A good theory has precise concepts and a non-reductionist approach to relating first-person human experience with physical slash chemical 
outer world experiences. And this is particularly important for sensory science, obviously. But there are some sub points to this, because here it's really important for sensory data to keep preference or quality data and intensity or quantity data completely separate. And another point uh, when relating to inner experience of humans, here you need to really make sure that any claim of any optimum for a process or optimums of process parameters has to be related to a specified consumer segment and never just justified in the technical aspect of the processes itself. The final and number eight point for a good theory is that it is systematically self-critic when it comes to making a possible wrong conclusion due to either personal interest in a certain outcome, confounding factors, or even uh, coincidental outcomes or just randomness in your data. All these things can lead to wrong data and it's very important that a theory is self-critical when it comes to these points. Level three. Now I'm going to really explain the short sentence but also the eight uh, short points that I've just mentioned. I'm going to explain them in depth. So the following is a thorough explanation of each of the features of a good theory. A good theory is the simplest possible model of the system that you are looking at. If two explanations explain the same, we'll choose the simpler explanation over the more complex explanation. So under this point, um, it's worth mentioning that from a theoretical perspective, the simpler model <coughs> of a system or of a bigger system is seen as a more true explanation because it better captures the essence of the, uh, the phenomena that you describe. And another sub point to this point of simplicity is that from an execution perspective, complexity is the enemy of execution. And another sub-point to this point of simplicity is that a simple explanation is easier to make specific because you can focus on getting deep in a few concepts. And another sub-point to the point of simplicity is that simplicity takes you faster to a level of intuition because you can only focus on the fundamental concepts and you're not confused by the more superficial emergent uh, properties of the system that you're looking at. For example, if you are a linguistic, you need, knowing the grammar makes you see through language. Or if you are a computer scientist, knowing about the, how binary logic is expressed in transistors and simple circuits, and um, you build on top of those understandings of the basics, and this can make you see through software coding because you understand what's going on the fundamental level. If you're a doctor, it is handy to remember the anatomy of humans uh, by heart because you can derive a lot of understanding of different symptoms and possible cures from this fundament. Number two, <coughs> there seems to be an obsession about finding magic bullet in small aspects of process parameters from individual organic acids rare or specific sensory descriptors? <laughs> is this the inside or the outside of a mango peel? <laughs> Two really small aspects of roasting processes. These theories sound like amazing stories, but are often grounded in the blue air rather than science, because the differences they work with are really questionable in the first place, and questionable if they have any hold in reality at all. A sense of relevant science of magnitudes of differences is where I feel that most education systems uh, are really confused. And uh, this is very important uh, in order for education to be relevant. You need a really specific understanding of the magnitude of relevance of different aspects of the roasting process or sensory evaluation. 
People seem to obsess about details, which leaves very little time, if any, to ask the bigger picture questions that relate what you do to the expected audience for what, uh, for whom you do it for. Three. This is with forms follows function. You need to have a specific perf- purpose with what you're doing, which trans- translates into a specific benefit for somebody specific. Somebody either needs to get a different experience or perhaps even better experience. Somebody needs to save time or get increased clarity over a situation that often leads to better control. This is key in choosing a narrow research question and making sure the method chosen is designed specifically to answer the question in the most relevant way for the decided purpose. If you are not specific in who is expected to to perceive or gain from the differences you are looking at, you can't design your sample set as the magnitude of difference between the samples in your project would have to be designed to be relevant for the particular audience. This point actually has three sub-points. If you are looking to find a small difference with certainty, you need to budget for a lot of data points to be gathered. Whereas if you expect a huge difference in the data set, you can get away with a much smaller data set and still get a convincing result. For example, if one person out of 10 reports a less intense headache from a pill, it could be a coincidence and you would probably estimate that you need closer to 1,000 people in the experiment um, in the group as 100 might still not get a clear result, as people can, uh, out of the 10, one person could, by coincidence, not related to the pill, just get a lower uh, headache. Uh, 100, you would start to see if there's a trend, if it's still uh, close to 10%. But if you have got 1,000 people, the effect that you see becomes more and more certain because the, the risk of it of this one person reporting a low um, a headache by a coincidence or some other reason than the pill, that coincidence uh, becomes lower and lower and you trust the result more and more. But if you only have 10 people, uh, it's not very certain because your first experiment with 10 people, just one um, a person reported a lower headache. So here it's clear that if we have an effect, it's small already. And that's expensive because you need to get more and more people to make sure that from the small group, you, uh, the, the, the result you saw wasn't just a coincidence. So let's see in, uh, if you still have the 10 people, but out of the 10 people, all, uh, all the participants told you that all of them had a headache that completely disappeared by taking the pill. Then you can conclude that the pill works and you might just do some follow-up experiments to see if there are other uh, humans around the world who are less sensitive to, to the group of uh, people that you looked at, but you have a fundamental trust in that the pill actually works only by testing, uh, testing on, on 10 because the effect you saw was huge. So here you, with this example, you can see how small differences are really expensive to map out because the small difference, you need to see that in a huge uh, amount of, uh, of, of people. And the, if you have a huge difference, then you can get away with a small uh, group of people and trust the difference. Another sub-point to this um, small difference problem is that the expected effect in the data set of the experiment is important to estimate as it would answer the question of relevance as a small effect would could be below the relevant threshold, even if the small effect is very certain. Again, if all 10 in the subgroup reported a decrease in headache, but it was on average only a one-point reduction on a scale from 1 to 10, the effect was certain, but few would pay anything for a 10% reduction of headache, even though the effect is certain from a scientific and statistical point of view, the effect is so small that it's not relevant for the audience. Also remember that if it is expensive 
In data points to document a small, diff a small effect, it is even more relevant to ask the question if the expected effect is practically relevant at all and therefore worth doing the experiment at all. A third sub-point here, if the expected difference is small, it is relevant to question if it exists at all, since there can be a lot of personal bias in claiming it exists at all. A lot of valuable time can be lost if a lot of time is spent on something that might not even exist or be relevant only or only relevant to a very narrow audience. Um, point number four. A good theory is specific, both, both when it comes to describing the circumstances and the input parameters of a theory and the output parameters. This point is elaborated much more in the coming episode about empirical uh, empiricism and logical positivism, which is a classical uh, line in theory of science. Point number five. A good theory has a specific, very simple, and with a very narrow predictive outcome. If a theory either describes an extremely small difference and or is vague in specifying the outcome parameters thoroughly and clearly, nobody would ever be able to really catch the theory being wrong because it did not really predict anything in the first place. If the theory does not dare to predict a certain outcome, an obvious outcome, and in the same breath exclude other outcome, it does not say anything specific about any situation and hence can't really be used for anything anyway. More about uh, this in the later episode about Karl Popper's critical rationalism. Point number six. When setting up an experiment, you decide which question you would like to explore and design samples accordingly so that they are different exactly to the extent that they explore the central question of your research project. But here people often forget to keep everything else equal. I often see Roaster's experiment with drum speed, airflow, start condition and other subtle, subtle aspects of the roasting process. And when I inquire about the color measurements, they seem surprised and tell me that they didn't measure color because that was not the subject of the study. If you don't plan your project with color consistency between samples, it will most likely lead to wrong conclusions on the cupping table because the difference in color between these samples will be a confounding factor driving the sensory difference on the table and not the more subtle roasting conditions you also changed and thought you were actually testing. Since you failed to keep everything else equal, here namely the color, because you were testing something else, you have created a mess on the cupping table that can't answer your fundamental research question that wasn't about color. But since you didn't co keep color constant, then your differences on the cupping table were driven by color and not what you actually set out to pursue and investigate. Point number seven. A good theory has a clear boundary and correct boundary between the inner and the outer world of human experience. Sub point to this, the first step is to respect the fundamental non-reductionist approach to this, where we will simply give up on any psychologist, uh, psychologist or social relativist trying to explain away natural science as just biased or superficial opinions as well as we won't accept any neurologist or chemist trying to explain away the hum human experience as something that is not interesting or reliable in itself. Psychologists and chemists can work together by respecting and using both method methods in parallel without any of them trying to reduce one domain to the other. I can't count the times I've been talking to scientists or read scientific articles written by chemists who does not understand how broad and correct sensory science is when used correctly, and any scientist who has accepted the use of the SCA copying form as an objective endpoint or measurement method in a research pr uh, project should be arrested and punished by the science police. Not because of the nature of the data in the form, 
not that they are subjective or anything, that's not the problem, but the fundamental violation on scientific principles and methodology where the whole proud and rigorous tradition of sensory science is ignored. Anybody more interested in this should study Ken Wilber's integral theory and Francesco Varela's neurophenomenology. A second subpoint to point seven in a good theory. A good theory has a correct use of the terms and concept subjective, objective, objective, opinion, preference, and method. I think it's about time to clean up, clean up the mess created by an old and outdated way to talk about subjectivity and objectivity as if what happens in the inner world of a human is filled with bias and bad judgment and only what happens in the outer world can be certain. I don't think that's the, the case and it's because people haven't really thought enough about this. And I'll talk much about, about that later uh, in the later episodes. But I'll suggest talking about the inner world and the outer world. And to reserve the term objective, objective, objectively true to observation grounded in a correct use of method and not with reference to the origin of the data. So I don't care if it's from the inner or outer world. Data obje are objectively good if the method used to gather and analyze the data is correct. You can just as easily get lost in bad observation of the outer world and bad application of method when you observe the outer world as you do in the inner world. So that is no reason to relate bias particularly to data coming from the first person data or the subjective world as it's traditionally called. You can have data from the outer world and the inner world, and both domains can be explored correctly, in which case you have objective data, or they can be explored incorrectly, in which case you will have bad and biased data. And this applies regardless, regardless of whether the data comes from the inner or outer world. So keep referring to subjective data when talking about sensory data as they have done in the new SCA Sensory Coffee uh, Sensory and Cupping Handbook. That only keeps sensory science often miscredited and not con perceived as a real science, which is a completely wrong perception of the science itself, often still upheld even by other scientists who have never had reasons to really reflect on the differences between the inner and outer world and methods for data collection in each of these domains. A third sub point to point seven in a good theory. In the domain of data from the inner world, there is an extremely important distinction we still have not fully embraced in the coffee community, which is the distinction between preference and observed intensity of sensory data. It could be flavor, but it could also just be loudness of a sound or intensity of, of pain and so on. From a method perspective, preference data and intensity data are both objective data. Consum consumer data is not subjective. They are objective data about preference because the correct method is used. Adding the term subjective here would be outdated and confusing. Failure to distinguish between technical data and preference data often makes coffee professionals assume universality of quality and lead them to have an oversimplified model for quality, such as is the case with the SCA copying form. Much more about that later. Or it also leads people to looking for small group blueprints of ro in roast logging software with curve patterns recognition or arbitrary calculations as if there's a really small window for quality and only if you stay within these very narrow parameters of or a sweet spot as it's called then you're doing it correctly. Good theories keep the technicalities separate, separate from preference and will 
and will show, uh, show you the possible flavor modulation for each process parameter. And then you can leave the question of preference to later to not risk missing out the complexity of the step of the product development process. Last and uh, point number eight. A good theory is cell critical to what can go wrong and how you can be wrong in your interpretation of your own data. How could I have designed it wrong is a relevant question. How could, can I calculate my data correctly without making mistakes? From a mathematical perspective, you have the challenge that all measurements of sample has natural expected variation, which is why a good theory always is critical to individual outcomes and collect data and, and co data collection. And you collect data to assess the variation and the risk of claiming a difference when really it could just as well be a, co a coincident outcome. Remember what I said earlier, if you have just a small amount of uh, data points, there's natural variations to these. So if you just have a few of them, you make, make, might make a bad conclusion because you think things has changed, but really it, it was just what you just saw was coincidence. In science, or it doesn't have, as I said, to be published scientifically, but if a theory and a method is, is correctly executed, the best theories and experiments will use full-on statistics, such as something called a 95% confidence interval for parameter estimates and p-values for any claims of sample differences. More about that later. But these are the technical terms. All right, so this is the end of the first episode of this episode series. And uh, thank you for being patient to listen all the way through this first episode, which is pretty long, but it's important for me to really flesh out the background of what we are saying and why we are saying it. And uh, in future episodes, we'll go even deeper, both in the different types of theories that we can use to kind of weed out misconceptions and vagueness in the way we work and in uh, our theories. So I'll go through some of the main historical traditions all the way from Plato in the old Greek um, and then uh, over some of the most important uh, ideas, uh, Occam's razor, uh, empiricism, where you focus a lot on, on data collection, but also critical rationalism, where you start to kind of weed out bad and, and uh, good theories uh, with uh, Karl Popper. Um, and uh, then I'm going to finally introduce what I think is the uh, best and most useful way to approach science theories and uh, kind of the aspect of truth and uh, self-doubt, which is expressed in probability theory and statistics and how this is, can be used to come out with some really good models of building theories that we trust but still are critical about so that we are never kind of leaving out new ways uh, of looking at the same uh, issue and uh, become uh, wiser and get more precise models without kind of just uh, skipping everything you've believed so far. And uh, we'll go really deep in, uh, in different types of theories and the importance of the first episode here is that I've created this uh, model of a good theory is with the eight points uh, that I went through. So these eight points are specific enough to use to kind of refer back to when going through a specific theory. I can tell you it's weak here, it's strong here, and we have a more actionable model to really uh, a lens we can look through when evaluating a method, how strong it is and how weak it is and where it's weak. So we'll go through uh, the models that I, uh, I'm i often um, faced with when teaching uh, coffee roasting and also the models ESA is often faced with when teaching uh, century methodology. So it will be uh, some of the most uh, widespread ideas on optimization of coffee roasting, the good ones and the bad ones. And then we'll also go deep in, in, uh, in really confusing methods such as the SCA copying form that we think is uh, something that is really causing so much confusion. 
And that's something that we really hope uh, will kind of, uh, that we'll find a new way of, of doing it. Because it's not just wrong on one uh, aspect, it's wrong on several. And I'll use the model that I introduced earlier to kind of weed things out and pa paint a new uh, way forward. So, um, and we'll also go through some of our research that has shown um, what's not true um, uh, about things that is, is, is so ingrained in the way people teach and think in the coffee um, uh, industry. Right now we have an article um, uh, through uh, peer review talking about uh, the irrelevance of looking at individual organic assets for any purpose in the uh, in the coffee uh, coffee business, um, so expect a lot of really specific and actionable uh, uh, reflections on what's what's useful and what's not useful when we want to get clear about how we create products and not waste our time in the process to create a successful business where customers are really happy and you feel that you are in control of why they are happy. Stay tuned and thank you so much for your time listening all the way through this first episode. <laughs>